Hey, good morning. Hi, I'm uh, Joe Creech or Joseph Creech. Um, put my camera down a little bit. I'm wearing my public health, my old public health shirt today. I used to work for them in IT and uh, joined RTS um, when Research Technology Services, sorry, uh, or RTS when they started uh, a couple of years ago. So uh, during COVID, I think. So yeah, that's uh, that's where I've been ever since. So I do a lot with HPC. Um, a few weeks back, I think my colleague Glenn McLaughlin uh, had a presentation on LLMs, and so uh, he's also part of my team. Um, but this is my first time here, so pleasure meeting everyone. Thank you, thank you. So uh, I actually uh, reached out to Ryan about an idea of kind of seeing what the interest was in Anaconda and how it's being used, and if people were aware of the uh, licensing changes. So I kind of wanted to start with that, but then. Uh, Ryan had some suggestions for talking about package management with Python in general. So that was uh, something I tried to dig into a little bit. Um, and then uh, you know, spend some time kind of showing some of how we do these things on HPC. So um, that's what I was planning to do. All right, let me uh, share my screen. Again, I work for Research and Technology Services, um, and I probably better should, should have put some other names on here. But, How uh, big is RTS? Oh, great question. So thank you. Uh, we've got uh, about 12 people, I think. Mm -hmm. And um, we're, uh, I know we're looking to hire someone to run RedCap mm -hmm. for us, because uh, that's something that, unfortunately, we lost our RedCap administrator. Mm -hmm. And so we have some people filling in, but it's uh, it's a lot. Red Cap is a big project, so we, we're doing that. And then we're also um, looking at some other positions, so someone to kind of manage all of HPC, the lead engineer. And, Do you have uh, research software engineers under you? or That's a great question. Uh, we, not per se, is in terms of like developing software, not so much, but uh, I know Glenn and Hector are doing a lot with, uh, with AI and LLMs and doing, I think they've developed some code. Uh, the rest of us are doing more scripting than anything else, um, you know, making our lives easier. <laughs> but uh, yeah, there, there's some probably uh, that could qualify. That's a good question. So um, we're, we're looking into uh, doing more with like the GW GitHub org and things like that. But yeah, we're kind of early days for us trying to get all that stuff organized. Mm -hmm. um, so here was kind of a brief overview of what I wanted to get into. Um, and I'll probably spend more time doing a demo than anything else, but this is kind of just some basic stuff. So, <clears throat> um, you know, package managers, there's different ones out there uh, for Python. Sorry, I probably should have put Python on this <laughs> slide. Um, here's some examples of where you might want to use one. Um, and this is kind of based on some things we've seen with HPC that's you know, what we do a lot, mostly, I would say, most of how I spend my day is is helping HPC users. Uh, and a lot of it is, you know, I've got this Jupyter Notebook code, how do I run it as a script? Or, mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, how do I get this thing to install? I, I tried to do apt-get and it doesn't work, and you know, that kind of stuff. So <clears throat> um, I don't think we have stats necessarily, but we have a lot of people using Python. Um, and so uh, we see a lot of it. Anaconda is very, very popular. Um, and uh, I'll talk a little bit about that later. So here's some use cases. Um, we, we see Torch a lot. So, uh, you know, this isn't the only way to do it, but one thing that an environment makes handy is you can have like a CPU Torch just to see how slow it is <laughs> and a GPU Torch and say, oh, this is what I actually want to use. <laughs> um, you could use that to test. And, uh, Another thing that's maybe more relevant to Anaconda uh, that we see is, you know, you've got different versions of Python. So you want like a Python 3.6, you want a Python 3.12. This can help with that uh, to keep them separate and keep your packages, you know, kind of compartmentalized. So um, just some basic ways to do these things. Uh, you know, Python's got the built-in function of virtual environments. 
Um, and this is one way you can use them. Uh, Conda does its concept of environments, uh, you know, either with prefix setting where it goes or a name, you know, saying, where do I want to, what do I want to call it? And it'll put it in a default location. Um, and, uh, you know, you can turn them on and off. One thing to note is uh, we see this sometimes with HPC. Um, I'm sure it happens on people's laptops as well. It's just, we don't see quite as much of that uh, in our jobs, but um, Anaconda has that base environment. And if people aren't careful, it's very easy to install all these things into base. And then you actually end up breaking the entire installation. Mm -hmm. So that's, uh, don't do that. <laughs> Uh, Are there so looks like that's been solved with Pixie, by the way. So I'm going to get to that a little okay. bit. Yeah, sorry. What's your I was going to ask. So these are two choices. Yeah, these are kind of. Uh, like I, I wanted to start with basics. You know, Python virtual environments are something you get with Python, and then uh, if you're using Conda, that's kind of the other really popular way to do it. Um, these are the ones I'd I'd say we see more often than anything else. Is there um, trade offs? Yeah. Um, there's a lot more you can dig into by uh, by reading up, but from what I've seen, and again, I'm sorry, I don't do quite as much development, so uh, I can't speak quite as much from experience here, but uh, I'd say I've used Conda more than virtual environments. Um, where, where Conda comes in handy in this scenario is you've got uh, R, so you're using R in Python or just R, uh, Conda environments make it much easier to, to keep those two things separate, uh, you know, more compartmentalized. Um, not necessarily sure that a virtual environment wouldn't let you do that, but I think with Conda, it's a little bit easier to see where your things are, you know, where your packages are. And, and, um, but that might just be me speaking from, that's what I've noticed. <laughs> um, there's a lot of, uh, I'd say another thing is there's a lot of, uh, uh, recipes online for installing something and they use Conda just as the de facto, uh, uh, you know, way to do it. Do you use them both or do they have like, Conda? um, I actually have not tried using both together. That's a good question. Uh, you should be able to, but, um, there, you probably wouldn't want to have a Conda environment and then do a virtual environment, Python virtual environment on top of that. I would think that may not work well, but, uh, Again, I have to test that. <laughs> That's a good question. I guess how many people use Conda? Oh yeah, good question. Cool. I think the other you one. can yeah. create both of them, but I don't know if that uh, creates some new issues. Mm -hmm. Right, and there's probably some space concerns. Yeah. <laughs> That's something we see on HPC. Is uh, Conda is very heavy. <laughs> it uh, it creates tons of files and gets pretty large pretty fast. I did uh well, no, that's not a that's not a good example. I did a pip install of of torch and it was I think two gigabytes, but that was not conda. Um but yeah, it creates a lot of extra files. So uh just a little bit about poetry. Honestly, I haven't used it. Uh I just looked at it a little bit and have heard about it, but I haven't spent any real time with it. Um it it does a lot of things. It, it's it uses the concept of projects. So, um, you know, you have, you create a project and then you do, uh, you know, particular packages within that project. So it's a little similar to virtual environment, to virtual environments or Conda environments, but uh, I think it's more extensible because you can, you can, uh, it's designed to be able to share those, you know, across uh, uh, operating systems, architectures, users, uh, systems. So that's, uh, you know, reproducibility is is I think one of its big goals with that, and the same with Pixie. Uh, Pixie is a offshoot of uh, Conda Forge, which is one of the channels for, um, I think, some of the developers. At Conda Forge is a channel for open source channel for Anaconda. Um, I think one of the some of the developers from there went to move to Pixie, create that. Uh, so it, it takes some of the shortcomings of Conda and improves on them, and you know. Uh, extends its functionality. So it also uses projects. Uh, so I spent a little time playing with Pixie and I was going to try to demo that uh, later. So that's uh, that's something I'm looking forward to spending more time with. I think that would probably be one of my recommendations for uh, using going forward. 
if you're using Conda or yeah, just or, or just in general for okay. Python, really, to be honest. Uh, but yeah, uh, so again, some of the basic package managers, um, pip will get you pretty far. You know, it, it works well. Uh, there's <clears throat> again some uh, extension extended functionality you can get using Conda and some of the uh, it, it doesn't do all the dependency solving that Conda and you know newer poetry and Pixie will do. So that's uh, that's maybe one shortcoming. And when you remove packages, uh, it tends to leave more cruft. So that's uh, that's another kind of benefit of virtual environments is you can just delete the directory and you know, it's gone. <laughs> you know what you're getting rid of because it's it's all contained within a directory. Um, you might break some settings and you have to go clean it up later, but you know you can actually get rid of the files more easily. Um, PIP's pretty straightforward. I, I do want to note we, one thing we see a lot with HPC is uh, it's actually might be something we need to fix on our end, but the uh, it, tries to install onto the system path and they can't. So, you know, they'll get an error, like, what do I do? And, um, you know, some users will realize, oh, this means I have to do a user install, but that is the answer. So, uh, yeah, th there's a specific flag dash dash user you can use that, that you know, tells it definitely install on the user path. Um, but if the configuration is, you know, set up right, it should do that without having to specify. Uh, it'll depend on the system. And then uh, again, with virtual environments, um, that's one of more advantages is, is when you're installing it, it goes there. So it doesn't try to install into the system path unless you're doing extra um, extra parameters on the command. Uh, again, don't use the base environment with Conda. These are how you uh, install the, the thing that this is kind of skipping here is uh, in Conda, you know, you don't just do a condo install. You first need to go to your environment and then do the installation. Uh, Mamba is a newer uh, solver for Conda and the library for it, I think is now the default one in some versions of Conda, but uh, it's much faster. And Pixie is even faster yet. So that's uh, something I'll show you in a little bit. Um, and again, with uh, Poetry and Pixie, the packages get installed somewhat automatically uh, when you're doing the project setup. Uh, so they work off the concept of having this project and then you have a, uh, a, de a definition file where your requirements go and then it will install them as needed. Uh, so yeah, here's kind of the uh, the drive for me wanting to, to have this conversation was about Anaconda. So um, they've recently updated the terms of service. The uh, kind of um, uh, prevailing theory is uh, they're trying to get some AI money, right? Uh, I'm not too sure if leadership has changed, uh, what exactly drove this, but if you go to their site now, you know, it'll say the operating system for AI, which is kind of true. It's not really an operating system, but helps you mm -hmm. use AI. Certainly there's a lot of very popular uh, uh, tools that probably a lot of you have already seen that uh, use Anaconda. In some cases, they've provide its funding for it or you know they're they're actively supporting it they do uh you know they do donate to to open source projects and things so uh we're not trying to just say oh they're an evil company or anything but you know they're they're basically they put out a license a, a new terms of service that at first blush looked like uh anybody that uses the anaconda channels to get packages is uh liable to or is is uh legally required to pay so um to get a, a commercial license and so they've had some pushback uh from academic circles and nonprofit organizations and uh there's been a lot of back and forth they've put out some new blog posts to try to clarify but still leaving things vaguely enough big enough that you can read you know how you can read some paranoia <laughs> to it uh so um there's some efforts underway to try to get this all clarified. So the Campus Research Computing Consortium as a working group, I'm actually on the working group, um, trying to get these details clarified. Uh, at some point, probably after the holidays, we're gonna be meeting with a rep from anaconda.com, um, Anaconda Inc. To, uh, to try to get these things clarified. But I've noticed just in the conversations we've had, there's some 
organizations that are just saying, hey, we're not going to use this anymore. You know, like, we don't like it. It's, we're not sure, you know, they're going to burn us again. Um, so there's some of that. But um, so at this point, and another thing here, we're going to have some white papers getting published to have recommendations, not to be a one size fits all, but just, you know, here's here's a nice summary of the uh, the, the facts we found and, you know, decide what what fits you best. So, you know, some some organizations are talking about blocking Anaconda through firewalls, and that's not an approach I think we'll take, but that's just something that, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty here. So uh, kind of the initial um, findings and recommendations are just stick with the open source uh, channels. So here's a little bit about different ones you might have encountered and or you will encounter if you use Anaconda. Um, so there's the defaults and Anaconda uh, channel, I think is a mirror for defaults, but they're both part of the anaconda.com uh, you know, paid uh, umbrella. And then Conda Forge is an open source uh, Conda channel that's also very popular, it's very mature, doesn't have every package out there, but it's got quite a bit. Um, that one is actually hosted by servers that Anaconda Inc. owns. That's a little bit of a fun wrinkle, but uh, they have smartly not decided to get into the legal waters of, yeah, we're going to charge for this, you know, because that, that one's more, I think the open source uh, uh, license it uses it would make that legally problematic for them. But uh, so that's another, you know, that th there could be a potential future where Conda Forge splits off and, you know, we're going to host this somewhere else just to kind of decouple that. But at this point, it's still hosted by them. But, uh, you know, everyone feels that that safety is. And then there's other ones out there, Bioconda and R. Uh, I think R might be hosted by Anaconda. Uh, ink, but um, they don't really use that too much. I see Biocon a lot with our genomics people and uh, so just some of the to tools they're using. Yes, thank you. My own thing. So, Conda is an open source. Anaconda is a company that built on top of the open source. Is that right? I think they actually might have developed Conda in the first place, but yes, you're on the right track that uh, there's a lot of overloaded terms here. Sorry, thank you. Yeah. <laughs> there's, uh, yeah, the layers of Anaconda with a capital A is a company and it's also a technology. So, you know, the, um, or I guess lowercase a is the technology, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, um, Anaconda or sometimes just Conda is thought of as a, you know, kind of the tool like Python and then Anaconda Inc. is the company that owns the, uh, the Anaconda uh, uh, development group and you know everything they're doing and I guess they own the, the code the, the parts of it that are proprietary, um, but then they also do the uh, they they run, maintain these channels on their servers. Manny has a question. Yes. No, oh, I'm I see sorry. that. Thank you. Uh, do I need to do something? Oh, yeah. Looks like looks like you muted. Hi, I'm Manny. Hello. Thanks for the talk. Hey, I'm just wondering if uh, you or other members of the group can explain to me the benefits of, of Conda or Anaconda relative to just setting up a virtual environment. I've tried using Anaconda before. It, it has a nice UI type thing going on. I, I guess when I was first learning Python, I found that attractive, but subsequently I just found it like, like you said, really heavy and and confusing. Yes. Um, <laughs> like I remember one time trying to set up a virtual environment and it, it started interfering, inter, it, you know, interfering with the Anaconda that I had installed. So then I had to uninstall Anaconda. So I'm just wondering, like, what what are the benefits mm -hmm. of it? You mentioned multi-language. I guess, um, you know, if you're using more than one language, I could see that as being a benefit, but you can also just set up a an R environment, R and R and in R. So, yeah. so I've gone more towards that route. Like when I'm using R, I'm setting up an, mm -hmm. uh, an R environment. And then when I'm using Python, I'm setting up a virtual environment with a requirements.txt file in case anybody wants to reproduce what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. uh, so how, how do they market, how do they market 
this. And then I, I have another question, which is maybe more a philosophical question, which is like, what is the business model here? I mean, this is all open source software yeah. anyway. So how are they restricting use and suing people for using? That's <laughs> a, yeah. That maybe I'll talk about that last one a little bit. Software to first. begin with. Yeah, yeah, maybe I'll talk about the last one first because I've I've been involved <laughs> in this uh this working group. So um as far as I know, GW hasn't gotten any notice. I think Clark would have told me. So Clark's the, the director of our, of research technology services, by the way, if you haven't met him. Uh, so my boss and Glenn's boss, um, and, uh, yeah, the, some of the orgs, um, uh, represented in this group, uh, the, the people there have mentioned, uh, a few of them have preemptively reached out to Anaconda Inc to get hammer out an agreement, you know, way bigger than GW or have way more, you know, of a footprint here. Um, maybe even make Anaconda official, you know, at their institutions. So they, um, the, <laughs> The little bit of feedback I've heard from them is that uh, it seems like they don't really know what they're doing. So that's a, <laughs> there's that. Um, I, I think this, uh, as I said, this meeting with a representative from Anaconda Inc. Um, that uh, the campus consortium will be doing uh, CARC in hopefully a few weeks will help clarify some of this, or we might just get a really salesy person. You know, we don't know, but uh, it's uh yeah, it, there's a lot of confusion. Um, my kind of take on it again is I think, you know, maybe the CEO was saying, hey, you know, let's get some of this money. <laughs> we have all these tools that people love and, you know, how can we charge them for it? So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know exactly what they're thinking in terms of the business model. That's one of the questions that's kind of before them in this uh, meeting is uh, there's a list of questions and one of them is you know what, what what's your plan what what's your kind of long-term goal here you know um and another kind of uh a bit of feedback we seem to be getting is that uh they didn't necessarily understand the academic world that very well um and we're just kind of thinking of you know i don't know reading fortune 500 and how can we get <laughs> again that, you know, I'm not a finance person, but that's kind of the, the, the sense that we're getting. Well, they're running um, all their servers though. Exactly. They They've got costs. Income. Yes. That's a huge, huge they, those, Yes, absolutely. They've got a lot of costs. They've got, you know, energy, they've got uh, all these servers they're running and um, presumably, you know, as I said, they're, when you go on their site, you'll see they're, they're funding a lot of different uh, organizations like, some different open source projects and uh, the money comes from somewhere, right? So um, I think they've always had some commercial uh, license agreements. Uh, you know, I would imagine a Microsoft or, you know, Meta would say, oh, we're gonna use you, you know, here's the agreement right off the bat. Whereas, you know, academics and nonprofits would be more on the line of, oh, this costs money. <laughs> You know, and coming back to it later, which is where we find ourselves now. So I think, um, you know, they've always so had I, some. You know. I, I would just say, I, like, I know uh, there's a company in the R community mm -hmm. that has a model kind of like this. It's Posit. Um, oh, yes. R Studio. Major, yeah. So they're a public. They're the makers of R Studio and they're a public benefit corporation. And so they what they do is they make everything free and open source. But if you need a license because corporations need a license because they have to have somebody to sue in case something goes wrong with their systems, <laughs> then, then yeah, they yeah. will sell you a license, but otherwise it's free to use. And plus they sell consulting services and it, then they have like their educational services, like they'll do workshops for you and stuff like that. So there's all kinds of ways that they make money, but, uh, but they don't go around threatening organizations that don't have licenses and telling them that they have to have a license if they don't already have a license, they, they right. leave it up to the organizations to decide, which I think is a much better approach. Yeah. But another comment there is I think the prevailing theory with Anaconda is uh, the next step they might take is, is likely to be something like looking at where the downloads are coming from, you know, oh, these are IP addresses. These look like network, you know, computers at GW or, you know, uh, Harvard or wherever. Uh, and that's, probably the one approach they would take maybe more for reporting than anything else. They probably already have those reports, but in terms of uh, enforcement, that I don't think they have anything mature enough to really do anything technologically 
savvy. <laughs> um, I have some quotes. Yeah. I have some quotes from the Anaconda CEO. Okay. My article in August, if you'd like. There's, to yeah, there's been some, yeah, some clarification, definitely. So, quote from, um, what's his name? It's Barry Leibert. Um, okay. Uh, for larger organizations with 200 or more employees, a paid license has been required since 2020. Um, he continued, though, in a kind of promise, it will always offer a free version for academics and nonprofits. However, he clarifies later in this, mm -hmm. um, those fewer than 200 employees and contractors, individuals or small organizations, Anaconda is also, um, it will be free. Um, Anaconda is also free for educational entities when used in course curricula. Yes. So not research perhaps? Yes, I probably should have quoted that bit. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, not, that's not for their that's IT. One of the things that's driven this. Yeah. Yeah. Um so it, clear. I, I looked at the most recent blog post yesterday and they somewhat even walked that back a little bit, but okay. it's still not crystal clear. So <laughs> again, um useful. And and I pulled this from that same blog post, this slide here. Um so uh, you know, credit to anaconda.com, I guess. But uh if we're going with the official installers at this time, we'd recommend using Mini Forge. Uh, it's a lightweight kind of variant of Mini Conda, which is already the lightweight version of Anaconda. It doesn't install all those base packages. I mean, you might look at this and say, "Oh, but I'm losing the data science stuff." Yes, they put it that way, but it's you know you can still install anything that's open source uh, and available in Conda Forge after the fact. Um, but yeah, th this is a pretty fast and quick install, uh, mini forge, and it'll get you the open source channel only. Um, so it's a good way to just ensure you stay clear of any, you know, potential snags there. Now with all of these, you can then go and customize your channels and say, oh, I do want the defaults, you know, paid channel. So you can add that back in. Um, but uh, yeah, you it may not be a good idea. So, uh, you know, depending on how you're using it. Again, we're hoping to get those things clarified kind of as a, just as a community. But um, yeah. It might be so, a good time to move to a better option. Yeah, so that's what I thought. Some, of the, some of the feedback we're hearing. Um, Manny, I, um, I do what you do. I use mm -hmm. um, the Python virtual environments. Um, and for every project, I create a new virtual environment um, based on the project name. Um, I find it not, I don't love it. It's very manual and I'm constantly like <laughs> losing track of, you know, my windows and which project is active in that window and things like that. But um, so some kind of like overall manager would be, I would love um, if it were open source, but yeah, that, that I have gotten burned by not having the virtual environments and <laughs> so now I rely yeah. on them. So, uh, can you make that bigger? Yes, thank you. <laughs> kind of comparing here and seeing, yeah, that does look small. Yeah. When Sam looks small, too. So. It does. Okay. Uh, let's do the font. JP, what do you use for your package management in R? Um, I don't even use a lot of the R environment things, to be honest. I just have it installed on my system. And it's just R. You just install things from CRAN. It's not hard. Or install it from GitHub. And I don't really think too hard about this stuff. I, I guess if I have a project that I really want to be fully reproducible, like I, I'm setting aside um, a repository where I'm going to put everything for a paper I published and I want, I want others to be able to run that. I might set up uh, an R environment um, just so that that's all there. And it's like a fully isolated little thing that you can download and, and run yourself. But for the most part, I don't know. I don't, I don't feel like I worry about this stuff in R. I just install packages and <laughs> install it on my machine and then, and that's it. Um, uh, it's it's not something I think a whole, a whole lot about. There's only there's only really like CRAN and then GitHub. Maybe there's a few others places where you can find packages, but um, that's it. Um, 
And so this is probably what I would do. I just posted a link to UV, which I keep seeing a lot about. I still haven't tried yeah. this because I haven't used, I just don't use Python as much. Um, but it seems to be like a drop-in replacement for a lot of things that's just totally insanely fast. Um, and I guess if speed is important, this could be a really good tool. But I, I'm seeing, I'm constantly seeing this. Like if people just keep posting about it and talking about like, this is it, this is the solution <laughs> to like all the problems. <laughs> Um, so I, I would probably use this if I was, uh, but yeah, I, I never use Anaconda. I tried it one time and, and after about 30 minutes, I just couldn't get anything working. And that's about how much patience I have. So if I, if I can't solve it in like 30 minutes, I'm like, uh, no, it's gotta be something better. And I just keep looking until I find something better. <laughs> so I didn't like it. Um, and yeah, I, I don't, uh. I don't, I don't have too many issues with package management in R at least. But when you do, it's going to ruin your <laughs> life. <laughs> That's right. Um, I don't know. I mean, yeah, the R environment thing seems pretty solid. Like I've used it once or twice. I'm like, yep, works great. You just put a little, uh, a little file in your, in your pot pack, your project folder and I kind of already work in project folders. Like that's just how I, I work with everything is it's like one folder. It's probably a repo, like one repo, one project, one folder, just one file in there and everything is good to go. And you can have different versions. So seems really clean. Um, so that I have never, yeah, like that alone seems to be like totally functional and um, I haven't had it, any issues. But again, like the type of work I'm doing is often these like one-off analyses type things where everything can be sort of easily isolated. And I'm not working in Python where uh, on, on a project where I might have like, I don't know, things all over my machine that I'm pulling together and, and, and it could be a little more complicated. Um everything is, is pretty isolated. And so I, I just work in isolated spaces and it's not, not too tricky. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. I think, uh, HPC, unfortunately might, uh, sometimes exceed that 30 minute, uh, learning curve, <laughs> not learning curve, but you know, tolerance. Yes. Uh, yeah, I, 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 did, I, if I can't figure it out like right away, or, or at least if I can't, seem to find like the next path forward. Like there was a point yes. where I was just like, this is broken so far. It's so broken that I have nowhere idea where to even look to fix it. And I just, I just quit. Whereas other things I'm like, okay, it's bugs, but I'm, I'm tracing the error messages. I'm finding a way forward here. But when I, when I hit a full wall for like half an hour, I was like, this is, this is, I can't, I can't resolve this. I'm going to, I'm going to try something else. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you want to see how bad it can get. <laughs> Shoot. I don't know this. One second. <laughs> I just had to change my password and I have not memorized it yet. Oh, thank you. All right. Sorry. Make sure. Okay. Screen there. Okay, cool. Um you make that bigger. Oh, it went small. You're right. It was only the tab. Thank you. And please share the IT root password. <laughs> on the well, it's it's mine. Uh -oh. <laughs> no, that's why I had to change it. I, I did in fact make that mistake. So uh, what is his username? I think we've had many people make that mistake. A lot of API keys. This one. <laughs> So there's a um, a pat as a sweet so a tool. Uh, I don't know. Dan may have heard of it. Uh, Dada two. D a d a two. Uh, it has like two hundred packages in it or something crazy. Um, it took a long time to get this to build. Even just looking at the environment is just sitting and sitting and sitting. <laughs> so yeah, it, it's it can get pretty bad. Um, yeah, I've I've tried to help this user recreate it on another uh, system and didn't even have any luck with it. I think they may have improved things, but he, I think he had a specific version he was using. Um, I think it's just called out here. 
sorry, this is like kind of a quick aside here, but um, yeah, <laughs> it's very slow. On your mission, yes. Uh, even this will take a while. It's just a really long, you know, all this stuff. And it, it, it is using R actually, um, which I am reminding myself of now that I'm looking at it. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it's just, and it keeps going. It's a lot. Maybe 200 wasn't quite right, but yeah, it's a bioconda. So some of it came from here. Some of it came from Conda Forge. That's what these, you know, this is the channel over here on the right. Um, good. There's nothing from defaults. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's quite, quite a bit in there. Um, Anyway, it'd be good to see if we could rebuild that in Pixie and make it faster, but or, or UV. I, I haven't spent any time with UV, but I, I did hear about it and it did look interesting. So uh, maybe add that to the list for next time I do these. Um, but yeah, so uh, this is here one of the Grace Hoppers. So um, if, for those who aren't familiar, this is kind of a novel architecture from NVIDIA. Uh, and it's uh it's a arch 64 architecture so it's not x86 um it's based on arm uh and it it's kind of marrying cpu and gpu together so we only have two of these in rts and uh sure don't have anyone using this one right now um but yeah so it uh you know the software is a little bit different because the architecture being different from what a lot of us are using i guess Mac has entered that world with their ARM uh, M1 series, M1, M2, M3 series, but uh, not quite as big in server and uh, HPC land, but it's getting there. So anyway, uh, if we want to do Pixie, well, actually, let's back up for a second. So we've got um, a couple of modules. Actually, I think just one, and I can't spell. Um, is the font okay, by the way? Not too small? It's fine for me. I don't okay. know about the <laughs> um, Sorry. So we have a 3.12 on here. 3.13 is pretty new, and I found out that uh, Torch doesn't seem to work with it. So um, This was just kind of a, you know, the, <clears throat> the when we do HPC uh, in similar kind of servers that we manage, we uh, we often do these system installs, and you know they're they're kind of compartmentalized again, so users can add packages on top, but they also have, in this case, it's a base Python with Torch installed. So uh, I don't remember this command, and it's not in the history. Yay! Get devices, is it? No, um, I did something wrong. Anyway, it's uh, <laughs> it's here. Um, I don't want to waste too much time on that. I'll look it up and get it right later. But uh, uh, but that but that has things in it. We could say like, um, our Python's here in this module, uh, and. Again, we've got pip. So if I just said, I'm just doing one that I know is pretty flat, fast. Uh, a quick way I have found to see where it installed it is to try to uninstall it. <laughs> so here we go. Uh, yes, so this went to my .local directory. So in this case, when I installed this, is this is kind of a, the RTS test user with permissions like a you know researcher. Um, it went to my dot local directory. So in this case, you know, it's just stuff for me as G385, whatever. Um, and it didn't try to install into the system packages library. If I did it as me, J Creech, it would. So that's, uh, you know. Um, so in this case, it's not doing a virtual environment, but it's just using your local libraries. Um, I think similar to what John was talking about doing our packages, you know, just kind of going into your local system. 
Um, but but if you have you know administrative rights on your machine, they may be going into the not the user directories, but the system directories. So uh, that's pip. Um, let's go ahead and um, let me use this module thing in 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 uh, HPC. What that is actually doing is basically just making changes to the path environment variable. And so it knows where to look. So we can say, oh, let's load Python 3.12 or let's load Python 3.11. Those could be different modules and all it would be doing is telling the system where to look for, for the Python executable. It sounds very basic, but it is important. And so, you know, it's it's one of our kind of our core um, uh, ways that, it, that we set these things up. So uh, if we wanted to try Pixie out, Sorry, I guess we're getting a little short on time, aren't we? Yeah, let's see. Oh, okay. And if I had two screens, I'd be copying and pasting this. <laughs> um, again, I haven't tried the UV or Poetry installs yet, but I think they are likely similarly easy. So this just goes and grabs the install file off the... Uh, the website and runs it. And uh, you know, they tell you to, oops, sorry. Um, and now I have it available, but it still may not know where to find it. It doesn't know where to find it. Uh, oh, right, there's there's a way to add tab, tab completion, which is a little bit longer. And what that would do is it would give me these commands by hitting tab after Pixie instead of you know having to look up the help or look at a website or whatever. So we won't do that just yet, but that's fairly simple. Um, so I'm gonna do a project. Um, uh, I think we just say test project. Yeah. Uh, so this is using a TOML file uh, and I think Poetry does the same way. Uh, where it keeps all of the dependencies, basically all the information about the environment. Oh, I didn't mean to call that text project. <laughs> Should have been an S. Uh, maybe this is a project about text. So if we look at this thing, um, it's pretty basic at this point, but the important thing is it's going up to the open source channel, Conda Forge. That's good, that's what we want. And it's saying, you know, here's our platform. So it picked it up from our server we're running this on. If I did this on my Mac, it probably would have said uh, OS X64, I think, because I've got the Linux, uh, sorry, Intel Mac. Um, and uh, and then we just say Pixie add, I think it is. Um, yeah. And so then it goes and looks for the packages and it adds it to this TOML file. Uh, that's how I'm gonna pronounce it, <laughs> sorry. Uh, so it puts in a dependency. Uh, a field into this file. And then, so, you know, the idea is here, I could take this file and, you know, put it in GitHub or email it to somebody and they could kind of rebuild my environment. Um, so uh, like I think it is very similar. Yes. Uh, it, it, you know, with, with ex different formatting. So this is actually pretty similar to uh, like what AWS uses for their command line interface um, with the brackets and the, you know, um, uh, is it YAML that has the, the hyphens? I can't remember now, but you know, there's there's a few different formatting differences with these, but um that same concept. Same basic. concept, exactly. It's a basic um structure. and then whoops. This is basically their version of activate. So Pixie Shell, and now I should be able to see some things that got installed. So pip list. Uh, we could also say Pixie list, I think. Yeah. So Pixie list is probably a little bit better. It gives us more detail about, you know, where some of these are from Conda, some of these might be PIP, but in this case, they're from Conda. And here's where they came from. So it did install the latest Python. I can change that. Um, it, it would have been in the dependency file. So again, if we look back at that, where this history came from. Torch will break. Oh, <laughs> uh, so, Interestingly, when I was doing the uh, the Python module, um, oops, didn't mean to exit. I, I yes, Grace Hopper. 
zero two. <laughs> I have to remember what the name is. Uh, when I was doing the installation, history can be very embarrassing, by the way. Uh, this one. So I actually had to explicitly use this command, not the one from their website to get it to work. Uh, so on the website instructions, they say to use this. That installed the CPU version, even though I've got uh, GPUs on the server. So I had to explicitly tell it it's the CUDA 12.4 uh, uh, path, you know, where we've got all the packages in this URL. I, I, I did the old trick of, and if you remember, like back in the FTP days, you open a new browser tab and browse to the FTP uh, URL and kind of look around, see where the subdirectories are. You remember before there were tabs. <laughs> oh, I do. Yes. Yes. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so, you know, I, I think I browsed the WHL page and then saw, you know, here's the 12.4. Um, it also kind of looked at their history section of the website. One of us all an old version, 12.1. Oh, that's what they're using. So, yeah, it, it was kind of annoying I had to do that, but it, that, um, yeah, I, I was, I installed it and everything looked great. And then I did a quick test when I actually looked up the command to run <laughs> to check uh, the GPUs and it said, you don't have any GPUs. And, uh, yeah, so then I had to reinstall with the correct one, but, uh, um, sorry, that was more of a, yeah, it, it, it's easy to not get it right. <laughs> it, it didn't break. It just gave me the okay. wrong one, gotcha. but, um. Uh, yeah, it's, sorry, I probably should spend some time having a bad example, but um, or an example of things breaking, but it's definitely possible. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I don't think I've done Pixie under me yet, no. But uh, yeah, I, I think it's pretty nice. Um, it seems like a pretty much drop-in replacement for Conda, but as John said, I think uh, UV is also similarly uh, targeting that use case. Um, so that's another thing I'll test at some point. Um, but yeah, I, a lot of what I'm doing is scripting, so it's not as quite as interesting. Did I also, so I was reading up on Pixie because after we mm -hmm. had this conversation, I was like, oh, never heard of it. So I should read right. about it. And then of course, yeah. John had KPF. Likewise. <laughs> um, but it also does containerizing for you. So you don't have to use Docker. Ah. That's my understanding. Like you can do a Pixie container. And it does the same thing as Docker, but just right in your, there's not a separate thing for it. You just. I think Docker has similar licensing changes that happened oh. about uh -huh. two years ago <laughs> or a year ago. Yeah. So maybe Pixie is magical that way. <laughs> Fixing both Anaconda and the Docker mean, meanness of trying to make money off their open source project. So Docker might be a fun thing to get in, or containers might be a fun thing to get into <clears throat> at another point. Uh, don't really have time, but uh, yeah, yeah in HPC, we work with Apptainer. Oh, awesome. We have a video up of the container one. It was really good, but yeah, they're still confusing. Yes. Uh, but if this makes it easier, then that is important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's something I, thanks for bringing that to my attention. I'd like to, again, I'm very, very new to <laughs> Pixie. I'd like to see how that works, but, uh, and with other ones as well. But yeah, we, uh, in HPC, we use uh, containers either with, uh, well, Singularity is the old one and now it's branched off into something called Apptainer. So it's compatible with Docker, but separate. Okay. Uh, and it addresses some of those um, possibly past issues that Docker had where a user could become root on the server they're running it on. Um, yeah, that is a problem. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> For HPC, it definitely is. So that's something. Um, but yeah, Aptainer is developed by the uh, CIQ, who also makes Rocky Linux and uh, uh, Fuzzball and Ascender and a few other things. But um, yeah, they, they're they likewise an open source, but commercial entity. So they, they sell support and things. But yeah, they're more of a light touch company <laughs> rather than what Anaconda might be doing. So yeah. Anyway, uh, sorry, I guess. Yeah, I guess the only other thing time. I saw that was interesting about Pixie too, and probably UV as well, is it's pretty much every language. It's not just R, Python, but you can cross Agnostic. anything. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really seem to care. Put your Java in there. Yeah. Um, not that I do that that often, but I could see it being useful at once. Yeah. 
Okay. Any other questions from people online? Looks like there's some chat. Oh. oh, this is for UV. Thank you. Yeah, I'll go ahead and stop the recording. So thank you. That was great.